Thanks, everybody. It's uh, good evening. Good evening in India. Um, my name is Yuri Punj. I'm one of the co-founders and president of Student, and we've got a, a got a real delight today um, in in uh, in our series of uh, student webinars. We're going to be speaking with uh, with Richard Saklani, who's part of the Student team and runs as our managing director in India and. Uh, has done an amazing job with the, with a new book she's uh, written. So we're going to talk about a number of things. Number one, we'll we'll talk to Richa about uh, what I can only describe, I guess, as a labor of love, writing uh, writing this new book. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about her journey because I think uh, you know there are lessons that she can certainly uh, give and sort of uh, talk about about you know how uh, all of us kind of get to the points we want to get to. And then, uh, most importantly, we'll talk about sort of a macro picture in terms of, you know, what are the kind of the best careers, uh, what are the prospects for certain uh, industries, and then obviously, uh, you know, how do you manage a career, and we can talk about that. And I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A where, you know, uh, you get to talk to Richa, who in my mind is one of the top uh, career counselors in the country as well. So, uh, Richard, thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing this. Um, Hi, Yuri. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm so happy to now be able to connect to people through this book and also through the webinar about the stuff that I've been doing for many years. And as Yuri rightly said, really is a labor of love. So, Richard, they say, uh, you know, writing a book is, is probably one of the toughest things you can do. Uh, why don't you give us a sense of uh, you know how this whole thing happened and uh, you know uh, what was the process like and things like that just uh, just out of curiosity. Right, Yuri. Thanks. So you know I've been actually working with students in career guidance since two thousand four. So that's it's really been a long time. And several times during this journey, I thought of putting my uh, thoughts together in a book. But you know, uh, always when I would approach a publisher, they would say, OK, send me a book proposal, which itself is a very daunting task. I mean, if any of you have ever thought of putting a book together and you've ever seen a book proposal form, they ask you questions like, what is your book competing against? What will the synopsis of different chapters be? And you know, that itself is quite daunting. So I'd say, yes, yes, I'd come around to it. But then last year, Hatchet reached out to me, so they uh, probably got to know of the work that we are doing uh, through I Know Me with students and with schools, etc. So they reached out with a proposal themselves saying, would you like to write a book on careers? So for me, it was really like, you know, a gift uh, and a huge opportunity. So uh, I really jumped at it and uh, here I am. No, it's, I think it's wonderful and, I, and, and the book is doing really, really well. And, you know, for all of our uh, people who are listening, uh, you know, it's available on Amazon. It's available in a number of bookstores. And then, obviously, if you guys need help uh, getting the book, uh, you know, you can send us a message uh, after the webinar is over, and we can facilitate that uh, that as well. Um, so, Richa, I guess one of the things is, you know, I think you've got an interesting sort of um, background, and you know, all the way from uh, Saint Stephen's to uh, I am Ahmedabad, and then you did. You were in the financial sector, and obviously, and you know, been doing the career and uh, education space at this. Uh, can you talk about kind of how you got to where you are, and sort of some of the lessons you learned? I think it will be useful to kind of give some context for our audience as well. Yes, absolutely. So I'll try and uh, be brief about it because you know I've done so many different things in my life. So briefly, you know, I grew up in a small town in Jharkhand called Dhanbad. You know, those of you who watched uh, Gangs of Wasipur, you might be familiar with this town. It was a very peaceful town, but it was very much the kind of town that three idiots uh, summarizes, you know, a medicine and engineering kind of world. And uh, I didn't get through engineering, honestly. And so I came to Delhi. I studied economics at St. Stephen's. And uh, then went on to, so I explored for a while whether I should do an MA in economics and a PhD because the idea of academics attracted me, but economics was not really my kind of subject. So um, I think the thing really was that from the beginning, what I really enjoyed was working with people and I didn't really have 
an idea how best you could do that. So the idea of academics and teaching was great, but economics was not the thing, right? So uh, I worked with Business Today in business journalism for a while, then uh, went on to do an MBA. Pretty much, you know, everybody was doing an MBA. So I studied at IIM Ahmedabad, and uh, at that time, you know, banking and the financial sector was the hot area to be in. So I joined a bank, worked there for a while. Then I joined CNBC India, worked as a stock analyst for a while. So it took me all this while to actually acknowledge what I just said about the fact that I wanted to work with people, and I felt that you know this is what I really want to do. So um, after a few years as a in the sector, I moved out and I started working in training which was an easy thing for me to pick up because there were freelance projects and you know while i was figuring out what i wanted to do but i started enjoying training so much that it was exciting to wake up in the morning and exciting to go to work and what really struck me is the fact that my relationship with work had changed fundamentally you know earlier it would be difficult to get out of bed on a monday morning and you know you'd have to keep hitting your alarm and putting it on snooze before you could finally jump out but you know here i was waking up in the morning and saying this is what i want to do this is what i'm excited about and from there came this thought about working with people to actually build career areas that they would love and enjoy so i started i spent about 6 8 months just doing research and learning and then i started working with a few schools uh, luckily i got to work with very good institutes to begin with i worked with sanskriti school and doon school in the very first year that i did work and then i worked with iilm the business institute and slowly with imt ghaziabad and you know slowly our work started expanding and i trained myself in a lot of the tools that we use so initially we tried a lot of different tools and eventually sort of arrived at the understanding that i have of careers today sorry i said it would be brief no no listen i i think that that's very useful i mean i think one of the questions and and you and i know this uh you know both on the study abroad questions we get and then obviously on the career guidance for student is that you know kind of uh, mapping out a career plan is one of the most stressful things we not only hear from our parents you know who want their children to you know be on the right path but obviously for the for people who are either starting out in their career and trying to figure out you know what direction do i go in or you know you are you are in a job and you kind of want to make a change or you're unhappy and you know i think i think you said it well one of the you know you know things we always hear there is you know if you love what you do you'll never have to work uh, another day in your life right so um it's kind of really finding your your passion let me ask you this what was the role of kind of uh mentors in your life in terms of you know people who kind of guided you and kind of helped you um the importance of that well i would say a lot of course so at the very beginning i just to make this move i was helped by uh, mrs renu rajpal who is a herself a corporate trainer and who you worked for very long in industry and training and she's the one who introduced me to the myers briggs type indicator the tool that i eventually approached the career work through so uh um, just the fact that she told me that yes you know whatever you feel about your relationship with the work is correct and you should follow your path and you know otherwise one keeps forcing oneself to do things that don't work so that was huge it gave me the confidence to make a move and then she guided me along the path to help me choose tools learn discuss stuff create the program etc so post that i think i've been supported a lot uh, again one of the very uh, huge supports i've had is mentorship from Uh, Sanjeev Bichandani, who is the founder of Nokri. So from the very beginning, he was extremely supportive. He allowed us to use the Nokri platform to test some of our products. He um, actually uh, collaborated with us when they launched Shiksha. dot com, and for several years when they launched, and we were handling the entire counseling space with them. And at any stage, you know, whenever we will have wanted to expand, change, he's always there to bounce off ideas. So you know that uh, just gives a lot of support. and then you know a lot of the clients that who were extremely supportive to us for example basanwadi school uh, mrs krishnan and mr arun kapoor in every way uh, you know both supported us helped us develop some of our products for the younger kids uh, sanskriti school mrs ishwaran she was my former partner arti anand's mentor so she sort of also helped us 
make the first step forward. So obviously, you know, we, we would meet a lot of people and share with them what we were trying to do. They would give us their two bits and add their value to us and open doors for us. I think it was hugely helpful, really a blessing. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I agree with you even, um, you know, for myself personally as well. I mean, it's it's a journey that, you know, you're re it's not a journey you take alone. There are many people who are going to help you along the way. And I think one of the key things is kind of identifying people, you know, who can help you and sort of guide you and, and, and things like that. You know, some of the things that you've kind of uh, wanted to do in this book as well. So I guess um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we consistently get asked, and, and you know this as well, is, you know, what, as a young person starting out, either you're graduated and, you know, it's early on, or maybe you've been in the job force for a number of years, how do we think about our career, like the whole career path from a, a you know, strategic point of view, and then obviously tactically, how do we accomplish those goals? Well, how how should we think about that as as if I'm a young person and things like that and thinking about it? So I would say, see, when I just start working, are you know some of the most delightful as well as some of the toughest years of my life, because uh, work is always uh, more demanding than what college life has been. Even though we think differently while we're in college, we think once I'm done with this, I'll never touch a book again in my life. I'll never take an exam again in my life, and I'll be free. And then you start working and then you realize that, you know, you're working hard, you're working long hours, sometimes you're sleeping enough, sometimes you're not. Weekends are too short, they go by before you know it. And also that you're handling a lot more than just your work. You're handling the uh, pressure of working with people, you know, some people who have more powerful than you in the system, some people who uh, you may get along with, not get along with. So that, that whole environment is tough. And at that time, I think that there are a couple of things that I advocate students should do. One is that in those beginning years, one should uh, essentially try and hang in there. Unless you feel very strongly that this career is not for me, in which case you should reach out to counselors. But if you just feel that this organization is not working for me, or this environment is not working for me, then it's better to learn how to handle the organization or the environment and pick up those very essential work-life skills in the beginning and hang in there. That, that's one thing that I advocate strongly. Except, of course, if you really feel in your heart that there's something else I want to do, then work with a counselor, work with someone who can build a plan. And then if you want to make a shift, then make that shift. But otherwise, if it's not about the work, but about the uh, culture or about working in that organization, then there are other ways of sorting it out. So that's one. The other thing that I advocate st students should do is not focus too much on their salary check in the first five to eight to, I would say, even 10 years of their work life. I would say the first eight to 10 years are essentially about building your expertise. And it doesn't matter what industry you are in. You may be in media. You know, starting salaries in media have always been lower than starting salaries in the corporate sector. And uh, at times they've been quite low. I, my first job was in business today. I know what I was earning at that time. It was barely enough for me to survive in the month. But you know, in a few years you work, uh, you start earning better. And if you hang in there for eight to 10 years, there's a very sharp increase in media salary. So someone who's been around for eight years, 10 years, 15 years would really uh, both get paid very well. Plus you'd be really able to do exciting and creative work come up with new stuff, new programming that you like, or whichever area of uh, media you're in. Similarly, if you look at a field like education, where again, salaries are determined by government pay scales, which incidentally are pretty nice now with the seventh pay commission. But even earlier, you would find that, you know, in eight to 10 years of hanging in there and being good at what you do, you would get leadership opportunities, which would not only allow you to, of course, do great work, but also earn very well and very comfortable with what people in the corporate sector would be earning. So, and even if you look at a, a thing like sales and marketing, right? Uh, sales salaries in the beginning are not that hot, right? You've got an okay salary and you have a tough target. But if you're someone who does great with sales and marketing and you approve yourself, then you're worth your weight in gold. But it takes that eight or 10 years for you to actually build your value in the market. And one needs to put in that time and effort. And at that time, you don't need to be looking at the scoreboard. 
more you should be looking at hanging in in some place, picking up skills, leading teams, learning different things. So those would be the two things that I would really tell someone uh, starting out in their career. Right. I mean, one of the things, um, you know, when we speak with students, and, and I think you rightly said is, you know, when you ask them what they want to do, a lot of them say, well, I want to make a lot of money. Uh, you know, I want to be rich. I want to be able to, you know, afford luxuries and stuff like that. And often, you know, probably the most successful people in the world um, have taken uh, just the opposite route, right? Where money is, I mean, clearly it's important for all of us, but having a passion for, uh, you know, your job, your career and stuff like that is probably the most important thing. And the money, if uh, the money will take care of itself. Um, Richard, the other thing is, you know, what's interesting now is kind of uh, maybe when you and I were kind of joining the workforce and stuff like that, uh, the startup culture was not around, um, particularly in India. I think in India now, uh, what's happened is, you know, with with uh, with capital flowing into into the country, investors looking for opportunities. This whole idea of startup versus an established businesses, where you know, uh, well-known corporations. How should people think about that? You know, uh, you know, a startup environment versus a, a much more structured environment, particularly early on in the careers. So uh, here, I, you know, the people have two types of views. And uh, when we were at I M Ahmedabad, there was this beautiful course on entrepreneurship that was run, where uh, the professor who was, you know, he had a huge fan following. He was a wonderful professor. His view really was that if you have it in you to set up something on your own, then just go out and do it and don't wait. Do it now. You're ready. You know, but over the years, having talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, I've uh, sort of built a slightly different view where I think that one should work for uh, three to four years. So ideally, I would say, you know, do your graduation, work for a year or so. And at that time, you would probably end up working in a small company or a startup since you're just a graduate. Except, of course, if you, you know, a topper from a high, very high brand college and then uh, do an MBA from a really good place, work in a large multinational firm for a couple of years. So you see how large successful businesses are run. You understand processes, systems, teams, organizations, etc. onboarding, HR systems. You understand really how a full fledged, full blown organization is run. And by this time, you would be about 27, 28. To me, that's always the best time to take the plunge if that's what you really want to do. And, uh, um, you know, you're young enough to still um, be willing to take risks and not stress too much. And you are old enough to have a network of people in the industry, you know, to perhaps have bought a car, you know, stabilized your lifestyle a little bit. So uh, to me, that's really the sweet spot. Uh, having said that, Yuri, uh, given that the startup culture is huge, uh, as we all know, it attracts a lot of people and it's really worthwhile understanding what entrepreneurship is all about before we jump into it. Uh, but again, I know so many young people who jump into it, who check it out for two, three years. If it doesn't work, it's not so difficult to be absorbed back into industry. So if your heart's really in it, I would say take the plunge, but just give yourself a little bit of time before you jump into it. Got it. Um, obviously, uh, one of the ways to kind of uh, um, one of your first impressions you make with a potential employer is obviously through your resume. And then hopefully as if you get through that round with through your interview, can you kind of just give us a maybe some of the most common mistakes people make with either their resume or their interviewing things and um, you know, how they should think about uh, uh, doing those two important parts of the uh, employment picture. So Yuri, I've been working with students in um, building their resumes and presenting themselves in inter interviews for several years. And for the last four or five years, I've been working with Ashoka with their postgraduate batch and now with their undergraduate batch and uh, with several institutes in and around uh, Delhi, Gurgaon. And the number one thing that I think in, we need to learn as, and you know, pardon me for saying Indian students, I think it's particularly something that as Indians we are lacking perhaps because of our culture is the ability to sell yourself, you know, taking charge of the fact that you're selling yourself, understanding 
that a resume is a selling document. It's sort of like a brochure, right? And similarly, an interview is a selling conversation where you are trying to sell not yourself in the sense that you sell your soul or your body, but you know, you're selling your uh, skills, you are selling your ability to make results happen. And selling is always your problem. So you need to take charge of that conversation. So when I work with students, I find that that's the fundamental thing, this shift I need to make students to make. They're usually sitting in an interview room as if they were in a viva or in an examination waiting to be asked questions which they will answer. And they need to flip that to say that I need to be making a selling pitch and I need to be guiding that person to see reasons why they should hire me. That it's, I need to be leading that conversation. So the analogy I make to them is that if you were to walk into a showroom where someone was selling a television, what good would a salesperson who would be standing next to a television set and smiling be to you? Unless he stepped forward and said, let me tell you about this. And that's the role that you need to play. So I think that's the fundamental skill that as Indians, we need to learn in uh, resumes and interviews, just the art of selling yourself. However cr crass that sounds. Yeah, yeah. No, listen, I think, it, uh, you know, you and I, and at student, when we even get resumes, you know, for uh, uh, potential people who want to work for us and stuff like that, you know, I think we, you and I are always amazed at, um, you know, you'll, you'll get things like even spelling errors on a, on a resume or, you know, grammatical errors. And, you know, if, if the, if the prospect doesn't take, um, you know, enough time to even run a spell check and stuff like that, it just reflects very poorly on it. And you would, you wouldn't think it would happen, but it happens a lot more than, than I think we, you and I even expect, right. In terms of when we see some of these resumes. Absolutely. I, I agree. And right. so uh, we really coach students to take care of that. But I agree with you, yes. Right. Um, Tanma, can you uh, move the slides to the next slide? I think the next slide kind of just gives you... So, uh, Richard, clearly you've covered an amazing amount of ground with this book. And I know, th so this is the table of contents. I mean, can you just give us a sense of, you know, all... I mean, it, it's an amazingly wide... Uh, array of sort of industries and 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 uh, and information that you've put together. Uh, can, can can you just talk a little bit about that? So uh, I did try to cover everything that's uh, traditional as well as some of the big fields that are new. And even among the fields that are traditional, for example, engineering and scientific research and biotechnology, I uh, I tried to look at it from today's lens to see you know what is happening today. Uh, so that. What what I've also tried to do with the book is make it accessible to students by putting interesting snippets here and there and making every piece of information really short and snappy so that they can pick up stuff very quickly and don't have to go through tomes and tomes of uh, words written out there. This uh, table of contents sort of shows how I, I, again, I try to organize it in a way that's interesting for students where uh, this is essentially the nine aspects of the basic tool that I've developed over the years, which is signature styles, where I'm saying that signature styles is what comes to you naturally. You know, all of us have something that comes to us without trying too hard. We just do it because we love doing it. We don't expect to be paid for it. We don't think it's any great shit because, you know, everybody does it, right? Or, or we think that everybody does it, but we really do it much better than other people. We do it because we love to do it. So for example, if you see something like logical analysis, People who love mathematics, they do maths because they love math. They do math beyond the call of duty. And there are people who hate math who don't understand that. Similarly, if you look at something like, I love to influence people. So you see someone who has a, a desire to argue, a desire to uh, make a pitch for things. They'll start off in a party. You have a conversation with them sitting in a bus ride or a car ride or a train ride. And they'll start discussing ideas with you because they enjoy doing that. Similarly, if you look at, I love helping and caring for people, there are people who actually will enjoy one-to-one -one mentoring, listening to people, helping people find their path, and it comes naturally to them. They don't have to work too hard. And of course, it's not as if each one of us has only one of these skills. Each one of us would have um, probably two or three. So normally when we work with students, we look at their top three skills. But here I've tried to organize it 
saying that each career, I've tried to map each career onto the one core skill that it, it uses. So it would use other skills as well, right? So if you look at something like advertising that's put under, I love coming up with new ideas. Um, yes, people in advertising would love coming up with new ideas, but they would also need some logical analysis, right? They would also need thought analysis and argument. But uh, I've put it under the skill set, which is the strongest for that career. So I would imagine that when a student picks it up and opens this page, they would probably look at it and say, oh, I'm like this and like this and like this and be interested in reading all those fields. And uh, honestly, like for any human being, more than two or three careers will be suited for them. So that's really the idea to allow them to approach it in a broad based way, but also to make it personal for students. Got it. Um... No, that's the, the, that's gr that's great. That's that's really really good information. Um, Tanma, can you move to the next slide? So let's let's talk a little bit about this, Richa. Um, <clears throat> so we this is the number one question we always get is, you know, what career is hot? Where do I get the most, um, you know, career advancement? Um, I, or I may I have no idea what I really want to do. Um, you know, I'm good at a couple of things, but you know, I want to go into a good sector. And you know, parents are always worried about you know, will will the child after the education be able to you know make a good living and stuff like that. But I mean, I think uh, let's walk through some of these sectors and you know, kind of give your thoughts about how how should we approach them. Yeah. So uh, I put this together quickly actually today. But I do think that I've done a little bit of an injustice here and left out design and scientific research because there are areas within design and scientific research which are also hot today. But I'll just come to that in a bit. So let me quickly run through these and then I'll uh, put the addendum there. So um, these are really the fields where if you have got skills in this area, then you uh, and if you have the relevant qualifications, then there is a lot of opportunity out there. It's not going to be very difficult for you to find a job and to find creative opportunities, to find leadership opportunities. To obviously, so obviously digital marketing is one big thing. So it's not just being a digital marketer. So that itself is a, a great designation. If you can build your skills in digital marketing, you can start working with a startup. You can start working with a larger organization, with one division in an organization. There's always place for someone who's going to be leading digital marketing. But also, if you look at the people who provide uh, platforms for digital marketers to work on, for example, a YouTube channel with a huge number of followers, or a Facebook group, which has, uh, you know, over 10,000 members. So all of these platforms are also hugely successful today. And if someone is interested in this kind of thing, it's good for them to start messing around with social media and start seeing how do you get followers. So I would suggest young students should start experimenting. So try your hand at a YouTube channel and see how can you build stuff and don't give up easily. Read more about it. There are a lot of online courses today that will help you uh, figure out uh, how to build your digital marketing skills. You can, in fact, go on the student platform and you'll find some of the leading digital marketing courses. They're not very expensive. They'll get you to start plunging into it. Read up on Google about it. Ask someone who already does it and see if you enjoy it and this is your kind of thing. So digital marketing is a big one. Data analytics, I think everybody's been hearing about it, you know, analytics, big data, everyone's talking about it. It's used in um, just about any industry. So you'll find stockbrokers and stock analysts hiring data analysts. You'll find HR people and HR consulting firms hiring analysts. You'll find um, operations consulting and marketing firms hiring analysts. A lot of uh, market research today is essentially based around data analytics. So uh, a lot of economics is based around data analytics today, economics, research, financial policy. So, um, you know, if you look at a place like Facebook and Google Analytics, they are used by just about any um, company that would be trying to uh, sell things via the e-commerce route. So and people with skills in data analytics would again find it much easier to get a job. There are uh, people who are looking out for people with these skills. Having said that, you know, just the skill or the certification is typically not enough. 
and if you start see two years ago it was probably enough because it's a very fast paced thing and two years ago even if you didn't have a uh, degree in data analytics people from history were being hired into analytics because they had a bent of mind for it but today because a lot of people have the degrees out there you need to have a little bit more than just a degree you need to have the people skills that okay so if I analyze data now can I influence people to understand what I'm talking about do I have great communication skills can I understand a client's problem and structure a data analytical problem around it so can I use my skills in a consultative way rather than just being an analyst uh, but if you get that picture right, then yes, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Software, of course, uh, all new technology is built essentially on top of the old technology, right? So if you have your basic grounding in software, then you can flexibly learn new technology and start moving ahead. Of course, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is what everybody is talking about. Hacking is the big thing. Sales and marketing will never go out of style. Uh, you will always need people to sell stuff. You always need people to make people know what's out there and influence people to buy. So if you have to, uh, basic sales skills, then I would say go out and build them further. Most leaders and organizations would be people who have uh, got a background in sales and marketing. So that's a huge place from which you can uh, build your career forward. I find somehow a lot of students today, particularly in business school, they're saying, hey, I don't want a sales job. And I'm like, you know, if you can do sales, then go out there and do it. And if you can prove yourself, then you're worth your weight in gold. So uh, don't shy away from sales. You'll find that, you know, leaders in consulting firms are essentially selling, right? Selling is a very fundamental life skill. Entrepreneurs are selling. People who set up NGOs are selling, right? So uh, sales and marketing is, will always remain hot. The social sector, there are a lot of opportunities today because so many kids are interested now with international NGOs and large, large national NGOs and multilateral organizations, there are, and CSR, you know, with so many companies investing in CSR, there are opportunities in field work, in project management, in, you know, uh, different aspects of social sector management, operations, media, in fundraising, of course, which is again selling. So the social sector has opened up a lot and there are a lot of opportunities there. Psychology is an excellent degree for kids to pick up because that can be leveraged in the human resources area. It can be leveraged in sales and marketing. It can be leveraged in data analytics. Um, a lot of artificial intelligence is built around natural language processing today and around analyzing text, which is a lot of understanding how different social segments use language. You know, for example, how, what does the word sick mean? So you need people, uh, you know, sick can mean that someone's not well, or it could mean that it's really, really good. You know, it's so good, it's sick, right? So you need people who understand how people talk and what they mean also to use natural, natural language processing and build artificial intelligence, chatbots, and, uh, and so on. So psychology finds application in many different areas. Uh, then, of course, education is a big sector and it's expanding both in terms of just pure vanilla teaching uh, with so many new schools coming up and with international syllabus uh, schools coming up in India. The salaries, salaries are huge. They need a lot of teachers per uh, student group. We still don't have enough great schools in the country. And like I said, if you are, you've been teaching for 8, 10 years, you will get leadership opportunities if you're good. So that's again a big sector that I think students should look at. FinTech, of course, we all know about FinTech. Everything from your whatever, pay you money and Paytm and MobiQuick and MoneyTap. And you have so many new kinds of apps that are using technology to get finance across to people, whether it is loans, whether it is uh, making simple payments. So you need people with an understanding of finance and understanding of technology. Of course, people to sell. So that's what I put together and what I left out, which I'll just add over here is some of the big areas in design. So a uh, web, web design, UX and UI design are really big, which are, of course, it's like marrying design and technology together. So if you love computers and you love design, then a lot of opportunities open out there for you. Graphic design and fashion design are also growing. So they've become much more, there are many more structured opportunities for students to pick up jobs, both with uh, startups, with larger companies, designing everything from logos to, um, to, uh, to websites, to print ads, to media ads, to YouTube channels, 
to the basic look of a, a, a page or a, a simple flyer that would be going out. Again, fashion design is very big because everyone's wearing branded clothes today, right? So there are a lot of opportunities for you to actually sell your design label without necessarily being a very well-known designer in the world. So uh, design and of course there's uh, applied scientific research and biotechnology which is expanding at a very fast rate and biotechnology particularly in Europe and the West there are a lot of opportunities for people to get onto the biotechnology applied research track. So I um, hope that was not too long yeah, yeah, but I'm great. just sort of trying great. to tell you. Uh, Tatma, I want to make sure we leave enough time for questions. Can you quickly go to the next slide? And Richa, if you could just give a, a brief sort of, um, you know, uh, analysis of what you're trying to say here, and then we'll, let's open it up to uh, questions and, and concerns that our, our audience has. Yeah, I'll do that. And I also just want to tell people, if you want to ask a question, just put it down there. You can... You know, of course, you can. We can talk directly in just a while, but you can also type your question out, uh, where it says questions. So uh, here, where it says uh, careers by subject, I've just tried to map out in the typical Indian system what subjects are needed for what careers. So this is. Uh, I just want to clarify that this doesn't mean that if you study physics, chemistry, and maths, which is the first block, which is um, I don't know if you can see that this is the first block, right? PCM. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not saying that if you do PCM, then these are the seven careers that you can look at. But I'm saying that these seven careers require you to have done PCM in school. Right. Similarly, physics, chemistry and biology maps on to these four careers. But of course, you can do other things as well. But you cannot do these four without having studied physics, chemistry and biology. Similarly, mathematics is needed by these four. I've written desirable in three of them. Because you can always do a course in economics which does not require maths in 11th and 12th. And here we are talking about your grade 12 subjects. Again, you know, like I said, data analytics, you can actually get hired even as a history graduate. People have been known to do that. But overall, that's not the trend. And if that's what you are headed towards, then I would say it's desirable for you to have your mathematical concepts in place, particularly to avoid pain later. And that last block is essentially saying that it doesn't matter what stream you may have done in grade 12. This is open to everybody and anyone can look at careers in this area. So again, this is sort of just an overview. I'll be happy to respond to specific questions that people have. And Yeah. <clears throat> Tanmoy, can you open it up to questions or like Richa said, if you want to just write it out, we'll, uh, we'll read it out for Richa and, and, and she'll, she'll be able to answer it. So. Whatever you can raise your hand. There's a raised hand icon over there. Yeah. There's an icon sure. on the left, uh, a hand Sanjeev. icon. Yeah. Sanjeev, uh, please um, uh, go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hey, Richa, uh, this is Sanjeev here. Can you hear me? Yes, Sanjeev. Hey, uh, thanks very much. I mean, uh, great session. Just if you could share some perspective on, you know, uh, how does one look into, uh, you know, when they're considering switching careers at an early stage. Uh, one may have started with uh, one particular career and two, three, four years down the line, uh, would uh, like to kind of uh, switch over to something else. So how does one manage that kind of a situation? It would be good to hear some perspective on that. So uh, I would say that if you uh, feel that you would like to switch over to something else, then it's a good idea to take some time to actually figure out what something else and not to do it in a knee-jerk way. Because uh, once you start working, uh, the cost of your time becomes higher and higher. So um, I would say that if you're doing this, then you should, uh, ideally you should approach a counselor, take some tools, or if there are two or three uh, careers that you are interested in, then you should try to, um, then you should try to speak to people in that area to understand exactly what they are facing. Do they like it? Do they not like it before you actually uh, uh, make the plunge and make the move. So it's not a, a bad idea to make the move because if you've got a, a clear sense that you want to do something else, you should go and explore it. But more and more and more, what I find, Sanjeev, is that 
when people um, often people approach me with the transition issue saying that I want to make a shift right but often what they do is that they just keep thinking about it so when they come to me they've got a whole bunch of thoughts saying I think I can do this I can think I, I can do this etc and what I help them to is to just structure it out to say that if these are the five or six areas that you are thinking about let's take action let's start exploring so my number one advice to someone will be that go out there and find out is there a job there how much does it pay what's the job role talk to them see would they be interested in hiring you if there is another thing go and talk to that person so start taking action as you go out in the market and see what the opportunities are and start taking that action connecting with people things start falling into place in your head and even if you don't approach a counselor in a structured way things come together for you Hey, thanks very much. In fact, uh, this question was following. I just recently did the uh, career assessment uh, one that is there on your site. It's very engaging and it gives you a very clear path of, you know, what you're good at and what you should be following. And it did throw up a few careers that I could look into. And that is the reason why since it give given me uh, one or two options, I was just thinking that, uh, you know, what if you start with one and then you kind of want to do the other one, and that, hence the question. Thank you. Thanks, Sanjeev. In fact, what we will uh, do is uh, maybe Yuri will give us a little overview in a while of the online tools and how people can use the online tool to answer this question. There are a couple yeah. of questions people have written out. Perhaps let me respond to a couple of yeah. those and then we can jump into the uh, video, Yuri. Yeah, that makes sense. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, okay. So here's a question by Samyak who's saying that um, I'm in grade 10 and studying in a CBSC school and aiming for Ivy League admissions. Is it wise for me to switch to Ivy board in 11th or 12th? Should I stay in CBSC? So I would say if you're aiming for Ivy League admissions, it the um, Ivy board does have greater value in the eyes of the a US university than an Indian board simply because they understand it better. And also because the IB board allows you to challenge yourself in certain subjects by taking a higher level of that subject and therefore demonstrating both the fact that you're passionate about a particular subject and what you can do. Also, it's project based and, you know, it's, it's very application based. So it, build, it builds your critical thinking skills and your initiative skills in a very uh, intangible way. But it's very clear to the admissions officer when they read your essay or they see your resume and they see what you've done that you you're the kind of person that an IB board molds. So from that perspective, it's a great idea. The only thing you, I would ask you to consider is the fact that the IB board actually demands more from you than your regular Indian board does. I know we think that a ICSE and a CBSC are very demanding and they are, but the IB board requires initiative and project work in each and everything in such a fundamental way that that is also extremely taxing and it requires you to work really hard. So one needs to just balance that before you take that decision. Right, Samyak? And um, I hope I've answered Samyak's question. Then I have a question from Prashant Segal saying my son is only in grade 9 and always interested in math and science so he's going to opt for science stream in 11th and 12th. He's not sure about engineering it yet so would it make sense to enroll him into coaching institute uh, from grade 10 like for Jyavidya Mandir. So you know uh, uh, Prashant I'm uh, not a great advocate of doing that. I've seen students uh, uh, going through that for a while and I find that it puts some, not only does it put extra pressure on the student, which is all right, maybe your son is up to it and he can handle that, but it starts pitting you against different students and it starts putting that pressure of uh, how do I rank in this, how did I did in this, how did I do in this test, etc. And if the kid is gearing up for engineering, it may actually put him off. I think that it's better if there is, if you're exploring engineering vis-a-vis -vis something else, Pick up those, what are the two or three fields that you are exploring and see if you would like to get him to do a project on it, uh, do a summer course in that area. Now, a lot of Indian universities offer summer courses. Last year, we had some 10 wonderful summer courses being offered. This year, we'll have some more summer courses that are being offered. Uh, see if you'd like him to read some interesting books on it. Ninth and 10th are really for building the passion and the vision. 
and then if by 11th if it becomes clear that i'm going to do engineering then that passion and focus is two years is enough really to prepare for the gae and you don't need to prepare for three years three years so if you ask for my perspective i would say that it wouldn't be such a great idea right now but what would be a great idea is to help him start exploring engineering what you can do with it look at uh, interesting videos in fact if you go and check out our platform you'll find that in every area and let him do the test on the platform the test will probably throw up engineering as well as three four other areas so at his age 100% it will give you five to six top areas for him in each of those you'll find there'll be some interesting videos some articles to read stuff that's very accessible for a student ted talks to watch so you know you just start building perspective i think that's what would be important for a student of this age yeah um, i mean and uh, uh, richard the only thing i'd add was um you know we help a lot of students uh, starting in grade 9 in fact uh, these days given the competitive landscape you know we've had kids as early as you know parents want to start as early as grade 7 but you know we've got uh, some amazing packages and and counseling services not only for uh, the career part of it but uh, for uh, the study abroad piece as well that uh, we'll mention uh, when we do the video as well so we're happy to help uh, just contact us after this uh, webinar and we're happy to help you with that as well right yes and uh, here i have a question from Anshul Singh, can you elaborate on the data analytics field? Does it require hardcore coding, or can it be done using BI tools? As well as it's saying that some leading colleges in um, in Canada. So I would say that you know, uh, data and analytics probably does not require hardcore coding, but you do require to um, you know you require more than just business intelligence. You require the knowledge of some basic. uh languages and software like python you require r or scala you would require some of the uh, languages that will apply uh, languages and tools that will allow you to actually work and different industries will actually focus use a different language or tool so it is very software oriented so if you're not not a software kind of person you probably will not enjoy analytics for a long time so the business intelligence is very very important but it's probably not the only thing that's needed so it's like you need like i was telling you you need to be a, a pretty well rounded person you need that business perspective you need the knowledge of software you need to love mathematics and just be able to see mathematical patterns and handle data and uh, as well as you need excellent communication skills and trust me you also need great team skills so uh, it's really a, a pretty broad package that comes together in data analytics as far as a uh, Canada colleges are concerned um so just give me a second so i I've, i've actually not got it on the tips of my fingers but i would imagine your mcgill and um, some of the leading colleges colleges british columbia would allow you to uh, build a career in data analytics but perhaps we can do a, do a, a put that together if we are actually looking at working with someone who's looking at an analytics course in canada then our counselors who work with canada can put that together for you so is that one second ah uh, we've got actually university of waterloo british columbia i'm just seeing tanma you've done a very uh, detailed thing on this on our blog itself right on the student blog you've got um, so if you look at it i'll just put um, uh, if you go to the student blogs you'll find a blog by tanmoy on data analytics courses in canada and you'll find that some of the leading courses top 20 data analytics programs in canada have been listed out for you and that would probably answer your question very very well okay All any right. other questions that we have not written out over here uh, yuri so perhaps we can get on to the video yeah so i mean i, I think one of the things obviously when um, uh, as you've gone through this uh, presentation with richa is uh, the question naturally arises is okay so this is great information what do i do next how can i actually put this all into practice and uh, one of the things we've done is 
and a lot of it is proprietary uh, uh, proprietary formulas and algorithms were built out into the platform using you know Richard's experience and uh, uh, you know just millions and millions of points of data points uh, were put into the platform to help you with this kind of process not only on the career side but obviously we've had some questions on the study abroad side so what we thought we'd do is just to give you a sense of what you can do onto the platform we'll just uh, Tanma if you can play the video uh, on about the student platform and some of the capabilities were built uh, so our audience can uh, get a sense of it. Tanmo, I can't hear it. Is, is, can everybody hear it? Richa, can you hear it? No, I can't. Tanmo, can you start from the beginning? Because we can't hear the video. Plate uh, again, you huh? Now it should be fine. Volume zero, uh, Tanmay. Tanmay, the volume is zero. You need to. What happened is that you turned on the volume and turned it off again. Yeah, that's on now. Still not there. I can't hear it. So I mean, I guess, um, sorry guys for the for the volume issue, but effectively what it is is, um, you know, you can build your profile onto the, uh, on the platform and it's uh, absolutely free. Uh, put in a number of uh, data points about yourself and then uh, based on that, uh, the platform tends to give you an assessment and we've got some questions um, and assessments so if you can see uh, out there uh, I'll show you the next slide as well just to let it play Tanma I think uh, Yuri can walk us through it yeah I'll just I'll just I'll do the voiceover Tanma let it go through so so really the idea is um, you know everybody's unique and we're trying to personalize, um, you know, your data, your journey, and and give you kind of customized uh, responses and and, and advice um, for your particular situation. So, for example, if you take a look at this, this is one of the sample things that we've done on the platform um, in terms of capabilities, career aptitude tests, um, you know, what projects you would have to do, um, standardized tests tips and stuff like that and then um, it produces a report so you can get a profile score again these are all free tools it's amazing value you're getting um, and then if you really want to get you know a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with you know either Richa or some of our other counselors you know we're happy to set that up uh, as well and um, you know the the idea really is um, not to just give you standardized responses but to kind of make sure that each thing is uh, each we believe each student and each person is unique so um, that's really the 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 vision behind the company in terms of personalization and things like that so um, you know we're happy to help um, on on both sides uh, the team works uh, you know both here we've got an office in India and a number of other locations as well I'm based here in New York uh, our other partner uh, Ajay, our CEO, is based in Palo Alto. So you know we've really got a global perspective on this. And so in terms of careers, we can not only speak about India, which you know Richard's book does an amazing job, but we can also give you an international perspective as well in terms of what we're seeing here in the United States and across the world. Um, Richard, any final thoughts you want to leave our audience with in terms of 
you know, advice or things they should think about or uh, final thoughts? I would say just two things. One is I think that, you know, it's a really exciting world of career options out there today. And I've, uh, I've been saying this since I started out working in this field that it's exciting for this generation to have so many options. We never did. So I would say that go out and explore options and don't be in a huge hurry to jump onto the first ship that you think is leaving. But uh, do your research. It takes some work to find out what you're really cut out for and to start working towards it. It takes some exploration, meeting people, trying out stuff, experimenting, and it's never too early to start. So I would say just start experimenting, do summer courses, do projects, try out stuff on the internet, take a class in some area, go and do a robotics class, do different things. And if you like something, then jump into it and get your hands dirty and try and uh, start exploring stuff. You can't go wrong because today there are opportunities everywhere, but try and follow. Follow your passion and that really uh, can really take you places today. You know, when we were younger, some some areas were really difficult, but today you have opportunities in a lot of different fields. So that's one. The second thing I would say is that do go and try the tool on our on the student platform because we've tried to make it really simple. It doesn't take you more than 10 or 15 minutes to totally fill up the tool and it asks you some basic questions and then it asks you, uh, looks at, you know, careers that might be suited to you and asks for your interest level and maps that together. We've got uh, amazing feedback from people on the validity of the tool and how much sense it makes. Plus, once you get into the thing saying that these are the top areas, then you can access the career pages. There are some very interesting insights and interesting um, uh, videos that you can watch to learn stuff about that particular field. Top companies, different areas that you can be looking at. So I would say jump into it and uh, figure it out. That's really what I would say. So well, that's great. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, audience, if you've got questions, feel free to reach out and um, obviously we'll come back to you as well just to make sure, you know, if you've got any outstanding questions, we'll, we'll, we'll contact you as well. So thank you very much and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Thank you.